It's always exciting to start a new year. Whether this past year was good or bad for you, we want to be optimistic about the new year and believe that even if those things around us do not get better, we want to resolve to get better as a person both naturally and spiritually. When you're a pessimist and the bad things happen, you live it twice. Once when you worry about it and the second time when it happens. So if you're an optimist, at least you get to enjoy what you want to happen at least once, and maybe twice if it comes to pass. Did you hear about the man who moved into a retirement community to spend the rest of his life there? He was not long until he had made several friends among the other residents. There was one lady he was especially attracted to, and she was attracted to him. So they spent a lot of time together, and finally one evening he proposed asking her to marry him. The next morning he wake up, remembering he woke up remembering his proposal, but he couldn't remember her answer. So he went to her and he asked her, I'm really embarrassed. He said, I proposed to you last night, but I can't remember if you said yes or no. Oh thank goodness, she said, you I'm glad that you have come because I remembered saying yes, but I couldn't remember who asked me. <laughs> Sometimes I feel that way about New Year's resolutions. I tell myself, this year I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to exercise regularly and lose weight. I'm going to do all kinds of things to improve myself physically and spiritually. But then somehow I get too busy, too discouraged, or simply forget. Maybe you have that problem also. So this year, I'm going to make this really simple for us. Let's together just make one simple New Year's resolution that should not be too hard for us to remember and not so difficult to keep, because I'm going to make it broad and very general. Here it is. Let's promise ourselves, each other, and God that we will try to do the good things we are already doing better. Surely we can think of some good things that we are already doing that we can do better, which can result in making a huge difference in our lives as well as the lives of others by this time next year. Truett Cathy, the owner of Chick-fil-A, when his board members asked him how they could make their company bigger, he said, we just need to get better at what we're already doing well, and the company will automatically get bigger. So let's think about the things that we did last year and then improve on them. This year, as God's people and as his church, let's make this one simple resolution. We are going to do some of the good things we are already doing better. So I'm going to give you a few suggestions of good things we are already doing that we can do better. First of all, we can be better at being nice to others, including family members. We can be better at praying and reading our Bibles and making daily devotions a daily habit instead of a happenstance. We can be better in our giving of our tithe and offerings. Start giving the first part of our income instead of what's left over. Better in our attendance at church and better at being on time. Now, I'm sure you can think of other good things you could do better. And then you could add those to that list. I believe if we set our minds to it, we could do a whole lot better at a lot of good things we are already doing. So to help us do better, let me suggest to you just a few ways in which we can do better. First, develop a positive attitude toward life. Many people that, I, that have committed suicide have left notes that said something like, I have decided that since my life is not worth living, I'm just giving up. I want to stop living. So how do you feel about your life? Is it worth living? Or let's change the question. What would it take for you to feel that your life is worthwhile or what would have to happen to make you feel positive about your life? Would it be if you won the lottery? Would that do it? If your marriage suddenly got all patched up, would that do it? How about your kids begin to make you proud or you get that promotion? Would that do it? 
What would it take for you to really feel positive about your life? Now, if that's the way you're thinking, then you probably will never feel positive about life because all the little pieces that must come together to make you feel positive about life will probably never all be there. I don't know about you, but I have learned that I'll never be perfect, but I can be better. So what am I focusing on? It's improvement, not perfection. If I've learned anything in life, it is this. You will always have a piece missing here or there. I don't know about you, but I find that I have a hard time getting all my ducks lined up in a row. About the time I think I've got them lined up, one of them invariably jumps out of line. I'm going to read a couple of verses of scripture from the book of Philippians in the Bible, written by the great apostle, evangelist, teacher, missionary, and pastor, Brother Paul. However, before I read them, you need to realize that Paul, this great writer of over half the New Testament, was in prison. He was chained to a Roman guard and surviving under the most horrific conditions. And yet, despite all that, he writes these wonderfully positive words. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. When you first committed your life to Jesus Christ by confessing your sin and believing that he paid the ultimate sacrifice for your sin, he perfected you by covering you with his sinless blood. Now, from that time on until you leave this earth, you are obligated and want to be made perfect by the following by following the example of how to live life by hearing, studying, memorizing, meditating, and applying God's word to your everyday life. Paul continued, No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Number one, he said, I forget the past. Secondly, I look forward to what lies ahead. And three, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God How am I going to do it? Through Jesus Christ is calling us up to heaven. Now stop for a moment and ask yourself, what is Paul trying to achieve? Well, to understand that, we have to drop back to verse 10 and read what Paul said leading up to his declaration. He said in verse 10, I want to know Christ. So important to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to experience that resurrection. So I want to suffer with him and share in his death. Why do I want to do that? So that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. So did you get that? Did you recognize his goal? The goal was to go to heaven like Jesus went to heaven. So in order to do that, He wants to suffer with him because he knows that Christ suffered for him. And third, he wants to experience that resurrection from the dead. Paul's ultimate goal is to be resurrected from the dead into eternal life just like Jesus was. That was his goal. He is reaching for and striving for it every day. That has become his main priority in life. Nothing else held a candle to the fire that burned in him to be like Jesus in this life. But his ultimate goal was eternal life in heaven with Christ. However, I hope you caught the message of what Paul was revealing. He gave us the key to experience eternal life. Here it is. He said, I die daily. Paul understood that to experience the resurrection... He would first have to become like his Savior by dying to his flesh daily. He would have to endure a whole bunch of things that would be would not be pleasant. You can read about his sufferings, 2 Corinthians 11, 22 through 33. He lists all of them there, way more than we've ever experienced. Now, here's the point. If our goal is going to heaven and having eternal life with Jesus Christ, then All our little setbacks in life that we experience 
are only stepping stones on our way to the ultimate goal of seeing Jesus in heaven. In other words, don't sweat the small stuff. Learn to embrace suffering for Christ as your school of hard knocks. If you apply yourself to prayer, enduring trials and tests, and keeping your eye on Jesus, you will someday graduate into eternal life with Christ. Oh, I know there will be disappointments in life, but every day that passes, we are one day closer to the time when we will be with Jesus. If you keep that in mind, then Romans 8.28 could not be any truer for you. It says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You see, the world says that the way to feel good is by climbing the ladder of success, by making a lot of money, by having influential friends, by receiving a lot of awards, or by belonging to the right groups. Those are the things that make you feel good about yourself according to the world. But God goes one step more. Paul says that God works in all things, not just some things, but all things, not in isolated incidents, but all things for our good. God is able to turn every circumstance around for our long range good. Note also, God is not working to make us happy but to fulfill his purpose. Happiness should not be a byproduct of doing God's will. For Jesus called, when Jesus called them, he said they were called true riches. Paul went on to say, talk about these true riches. He called them the unimaginable riches of Christ. What are they? Well, there's a lot of them, but here's some of them. Goodness, wisdom and knowledge, glory, enrichment to our life, grace, inheritance of all. Paul said, to me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. He went on to say in verse 16 through 19, I absolutely love these scriptures. He said, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will go down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. And then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and the power that comes from God. So again, God's ultimate goal for us is to make us like Christ. Sometimes that involves suffering, or should I say most of the time. We learn far more through our pain than from our good times. C.S. Lewis said, I suggest to you that it is because God loves us that he gives us the gift of suffering. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. You see, we are like blocks of stone out of which the sculpture carves and forms the forms of men. The blows of his chisel, which hurt so much, are what makes us perfect. Here's what we need to feel good about. The Bible teaches us that we are to feel good about ourselves because God loves us and he has prepared a place for us. Jesus told his disciples, he said, don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. You are such a treasured person in God's sight that he gave his only begotten son in order to adopt you into his celestial family. I tell you, that's awesome. Can you imagine a parent giving up their one and only biological son in order to adopt you into their family? Wow. Or even greater, can you imagine a king adopting you into his royal family. The knowledge of that should make you feel really special and highly valuable. It should make you feel better about yourself. Does it? The previous scripture that I put on the screen for you was Romans 8, 28 that said, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. 
I've heard people read and quote that verse all my life when they're experiencing a severe trial. But that is not a place to stop. The scripture is the launching pad for the next two verses. It says, for or because God knew his people in advance, and he chose us to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself, and having given them and having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. Wow. Let's read that scripture again. Let's read it this time in the first person. I want you to say it with me. For God knew me in advance, and he chose me to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen me, he called me to come to him. And having called me, he gave me right standing with himself. And having given me right standing, he gave me his glory. Hallelujah. God's purpose for all people was not an afterthought. It was settled before the foundation of the world. He chose me. He called me. He gave me right standing with him. And he gave me his glory. Wow. Here's what Satan and the devil and the false prophets of this world don't want you to know. Being made in the image of God, man was the crown of creation. That's powerful. Mankind was God's crowning achievement of everything that he had made. God created us in love. He sent his son to redeem us in love. He sustains us with his love, and he will return with love for his children, and he will lovingly usher us into eternal life. People are to serve and honor God. If you believe in Christ and what he did for you on the cross, you can rejoice in the fact that God has always known you. God's love is eternal. It's from everlasting to everlasting. His wisdom and power are supreme. And he will guide and protect you until one day that you stand in his presence. It's no wonder that our young people today have poor self-images when they go to school and read books that tell them that they are products of blind chance, that they are just accidents of nature, animalistic, unplanned, unloved, unwanted. The Bible tells us that we are wanted and loved and cared for by God himself. Jimmy, Jimmy Vallett, but I forget how to say his name, but his nickname was Jimmy V, was head coach of North Carolina State University in 1983 when they won the NCAA basketball tournament against all odds. I actually saw that game, and it's one of the most exciting games I've ever seen. Valvano is remembered for running up and down the court after winning the championship, seemingly in disbelief and looking for someone to hug. Everybody liked him. He was always cracking jokes, and he had a winning way of dealing with people. Little did he know in that moment of extreme happiness that in only eight more years he would be fighting for his life. In 1991, Valvano heard that he had inoperable bone cancer. At Christmas time in 1992, he said, it's difficult to be thankful this Christmas because I'm not sure if I'll even be here next Christmas. And he wasn't. He died that next year. But that Christmas, he said an incredible thing. He said, I'm getting down on my knees right now, and I'm going to thank God for this Christmas and for every day of the 46 years of my life. He was positive about life, because he realized that life is a precious gift that God has given to us. It must sadden the Lord that too many times, too many people take this gift of life that he has given them for granted and don't treasure it for the precious gift that it is. Be grateful for today. Never take anything for granted because life is a blessing. Learn to live each and every day with love and thankfulness. Don't cry over the things you don't have, but be thankful and enjoy the things and the family and the friends that you've been blessed with. This year, let's get better at having a positive outlook on life. 
The second thing I believe that we need to do is develop a positive attitude toward God's church. And I don't say this in a self-serving way at all, because one thing that is right about the church is that we all desire to simply lift up the name of Jesus in order to reach out to a lost and dying world with the message of salvation. In fact, we exist to love God, love truth, and serve others. And yet at times I hear people, I hear about people criticizing the church, the pastor and his people grumbling and complaining about the church and those in leadership is a method used by Satan to try to destroy God's church. This should not be. We need to develop a positive attitude toward church. If you hear some gossip about our church or those that attend this church, you should not join in or remain silent. This is a perfect time for you to voice your opinion by saying something like, I love my church and I love my brothers and sisters in my church and I don't believe you have all your facts correct. I've also heard people say, going to church costs me too much. This is a statement made by uninformed people. Carnal people are always worrying about the church taking in too much money. How carnal can that be? Jesus Christ gave his life for the church. And then he asked us to give a measly 10% of our income out of the 100% that he has given to us. I don't think that's asking too much, do you? When people say it costs too much to go to church, I think it's a shame. In John chapter 12, there's an interesting account of something that happened as Jesus ate with his disciples. If you remember, a woman brought a jar filled with expensive perfume and broke it and anointed his feet with perfume. Immediately, Judas Iscariot and some of the disciples criticized the waste, saying that the perfume should have been sold and the money given to the poor. But Jesus defended her by saying she has done what she could. So the message is you can never do too much for Jesus. Do what you can do, but do something. Some people don't do anything for God or the church. You see, Christ followers have a different value system than the world's selfish, all for me, none for God and others attitude. The world would consider something waste that God considers valuable. The world thinks you're wasting your time going to church and giving. I can't count the number of times that I've been told that. I invited my Aunt Wanda to church one time, and she said, From what I can tell, all the church wants is your money. I said, Oh, Wanda, that's so not true. We love you because God loves you. Just come and enjoy Jesus. Keep your money until you feel differently about your church. She never came. And as fate would have it, I was asked to preach her funeral. I tried to say nice things about her, but the best I could do was she liked going to flea markets and the Cherry Street auction on Saturdays. If the world could look at your tax return and see that you gave away 10 or 20% of your income to help finance the kingdom of God, in this world, they would call that a waste of money. I had a boss one time that did not want to give me a raise because he said that if he gave me one, that I would just give it to the church anyway, so why give me more money to just give away? Well, in the first place, it was not in his business what I did with the money that I earned, and secondly, He did not realize it, but he paid me a great compliment. He confirmed my love for God and the church. You see, the things the world calls wasteful today are the only things that will last for all eternity. Remember when the woman poured the perfume on the feet of Jesus, what did he say? He said, truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Wow. We're still telling her story 2,000 years after the event. Also remember the little widow woman who put in those two cents in the offering bucket. She was remembered because she gave all that she had. Whatever you do for God in his church will never be lost or forgotten. This is a picture of our first Victory Tabernacle service. We had seven in attendance, including myself. The man on the right next to my wife is my dad. When I think of my dad, I have very good memories. I'm proud of him and his dedication to God. When he came back from World War II, one of the first things he did was to fulfill his promise he had made to God in a foxhole on the battlefields of Germany. 
He told God in that foxhole, he said, if you get me through this war, I'll give the rest of my life to you. I remember times when he would take me by the place where he gave his heart to God. It was at a tent revival they called a brush arbor meeting in Visaya on the corner of Walnut and Mooney Boulevard. He would say, son, that's where I walked down the sawdust trail and gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And it was the greatest moment of my life. You talk about an impact on my life when I heard him say that. That is probably why I'm a preacher of the gospel today, from his words, his actions, and his life. My dad was 26 years old when he gave his heart to God, and over the next 60 years, he never wavered or quit one time, making Jesus Christ and his church the number one priority in his life and the lives of his family. He was faithful, faithful in tithing and offerings and attendance, teaching Bible classes, witnessing, helping people who were less fortunate than himself. He also drove the church bus. He left an inheritance for his children, but greater than that, he left us a legacy of how to live for God passionately. My desire is to pass that same legacy on to my children and grandchildren that my dad passed to me. Believe me, if you will develop faithfulness to daily devotions, faithfulness to church, your children and many others will never forget you, and above all, God will remember. I can't promise you that they will follow you and do what you do, but I can truthfully say that they will never forget your dedication to God. And since we're on the subject, let me read you just one more scripture about what God thinks about money. He said, No man can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. The Pharisees, who dearly loved their money, heard all this and scoffed at him. And then he said to them, You like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. What this world honors is detestable in the sight of God. Now, we need to understand that when we risk something for God, we could lose as far as the world is concerned. But God has already won the big battle because Jesus went to the cross and died for us. We are winners regardless of the outcome. Oh, we may lose some skirmishes along the way because Satan is still the prince of the air. And there are a lot of things going on that are not God's will. But I'd rather be trying something great for God and fail than be playing it safe and succeed. John Wesley was a great English preacher of the 1700s. He was considered a rather spiffy dresser. One Sunday morning, he wore a bow tie that had long ribbons that hung downward. After the sermon was over, a lady walked up to him and said, Brother Wesley, are you open to some criticism? He said, well, I guess so. What would you like to criticize? She said, well, the ribbons on your tie are entirely too long and inappropriate for a man of God. And she took out her scissors and cut them off. A hush fell over the people standing there as Wesley calmly asked, now may I borrow those sisters? Sis, may I borrow those scissors for a moment? As she handed them to him, he said, "Madam, are you open to some criticism?" She answered, "Well, I suppose I am." He said, "All right, stick out your tongue." <laughs> Ephesians 4:15 says, "Speak the truth in love." We need to make sure it is the truth before we speak. We also need to be sure that we are speaking the truth in the spirit of love before we speak. So we need to develop a positive attitude toward our church. Third and last today, we need to display a positive attitude toward others. Robert Schuter wrote, It would amaze us how many people we could influence for Christ if we would just treat people kindly. I think he's right. This is a hard-hearted world, a world that does not always exercise courtesy. Most of the time it's a dog-eat-dog world. People are jockeying for positions on the freeways, for the parking spaces, and even in their companies. Have you noticed that people in general are mad? They want their rights. They want their place in line. And in their shuffling for positions, they get filled to the brim with all kinds of stress and anxiety. But the church must be a place where we all come together and we are all accepted and loved and encouraged and built up a place where there are people to help us carry our burdens and everyone feels welcome. 
If we treat each other with love, then wonderful things will happen for the kingdom of God. So this new year, let's make sure that we display a positive attitude toward others. People need people. When Terry Bradshaw was inducted into the Football Hall of Fame, he mentioned other players who had played with him and said, this honor would mean nothing to me at all if I did not have people like the people I played with that I know love me and as much as I love them. Another example of people needing people was Woody Hayes. In 1978, Woody Hayes was Ohio State team. He played a team called Clemson in the Gator Bowl. Ohio State was driving for what would be a go-ahead score when they threw an interception. The Clemson player who intercepted the pass was running down the Ohio State side of the field. What happened next was unthinkable. I'd never happened before. Probably will never happen again. As the player was running down the sidelines, Woody Hayes, the coach himself, stepped out onto the playing field and tripped the guy and then jumped back among his players, hoping the refs hadn't seen him. The player was irate. He jumped up and started running towards Woody. And then what happened was bizarre. Coach Hayes punched the guy. People were stunned and shocked. Could this really be happening? Yes, it was. And shortly thereafter, of course, Hayes was fired as head coach of the Ohio State Buckeyes. A legend had fallen. Sometime after this, a football banquet was being held and Hayes was to attend. There were not many people who wanted to see or be seen with him in public, except for one man, Tom Landry, who was the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys. He attended the banquet and he sat with Woody Hayes. Tom Landry was the Tony Dungy of our day. Everyone knew he was a committed Christian. So for Tom Landry to stand with Woody Hayes at this moment in his career was huge. Why did Landry do it? Because at that moment, Woody Hayes needed a friend, and he didn't have many, so Tom Landry decided to be one. There may be a Woody Hayes in your life right now, someone who's down, someone who has made a mistake, someone who needs a friend. Has the Lord called your attention to someone who is down, someone who needs a friend? If so, follow Tom Landry's example and help a friend, even when they've messed up royally. Why? Because people need people. But more than that, people need positive people, a constant positive influence in their lives. Jesus said, you're never more like him than when you are helping someone else. This scripture has always been so powerful to me. Proverbs 19:11 says, good sense makes a man restrain his anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression or an offense. So this year, let's make a simple New Year's resolution, a change for the better. I'm going to have a more positive outlook on life. I'm going to be positive as I look at my church, and I'm going to be positive as I look at others. Now, I suggest to you that as this resolution filters down into every segment of your life, that this year will be one of the best years that you have ever had. And as you live each day of it, you will get closer and closer to the goal, the heavenward, heavenward prize to be with Jesus. We are a year closer to heaven than we were this time last year. Everything is on course. We need to trust the Lord and love him and to place our lives in his hands and allow him to use us for his glory. Remember, you're his child. No matter how far from him you may have roamed or how far you have drifted from him, when you turn from your sins and return home, you will find him standing right there welcoming you back home. He will be so close to you that he will surprise you. You will find the road home was as close as the mention of his name. You say, Jesus, and he says, yes, I'm right here. I talked about my dad earlier. This has always been the picture in my mind of what it must have looked like when he left this earth to meet his Savior. It is what he lived for every day of his life to see Jesus and walk with him right into heaven. And this can be your welcome home also. So a simple New Year resolution. Whatever good things that you've been doing, do them better. And that's my message. God bless. 
I hope you enjoyed today's lesson, and I hope that it has been a blessing to you. I'm Michael Hopper, pastor of Victory Tabernacle Community Church in Fresno, California. Our congregation meets every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you would like to attend one of our services, please call me at 559-575-2984 for directions. Also, if you would like more information, you can visit us on our website at www.vtabernacle.com. And if you would like to help support this online ministry financially, there is a Give button on our website. God bless you and keep you and make His face shine upon you and give you peace.